and ended up doing sort of neuropsychology and psychiatry. And I wrote a book called, uh, what was it called? The um, Master and His Emissary, um, The Divided Brain and Making the Western World. That's probably why I'm here today. Now, I know your interest is mainly in the issue of the environment, which is also very important to me. Um, and first of all, uh, may I say that I don't particularly like the word the environment. Wordsworth would never have said, the environment never betrayed the heart that loved it. He said, nature never betrayed the heart that loved her. And nature is unique, personal, living. And the idea of her as a presiding spirit seems to me very important. Because talking about the environment makes it abstract and a thing. Um, and it isn't. Uh, a lot of people outside this room think of the natural world as a thing to be exploited. And every single part of that phrase is wrong. First of all, it's not a anything, because you can only be a something if there are lots of them and you're singling one of them out. And it is absolutely the only one. Um, and it's not a thing. In fact, I'm writing a book called There Are No Things, because I believe they're a, an illusion. What there are are processes that are constantly flowing, living, changing, highly creative. And it's not to be anything. It wasn't designed to be anything. It wasn't also particularly designed to be exploited any more than we would exploit anyone that we loved. So here is a lump of matter. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, I, is there any way I can control the slides? I can't. I, I just have to... Uh, yep. <laughs> Yeah, because, in fact, that was what you were looking at. <laughs> and the natural world is a completely amazing, self-perpetuating, self-delighting, extravagant, unnecessary, wonderful thing. <laughs> or, I would say, system with which we interact and towards which our right attitudes are not those of grasping, but those of awe and gratitude. Um, uh, press again. Oh, sorry, no, you've gone too fast. Uh, I, I put Occam's Day off there. For those of you who know, there's a principle called the principle of parsimony, um, in which you're not supposed to suppose anything unless it's entirely necessary. Well, clearly God created the world on a day when Occam had a day off. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is, of course, uh, in order to help you understand the situation in Afghanistan, uh, if you are a military leader, um, you've got to understand how populations move between these principles. But again, that's a rather narrow view. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> it's this bit here. Uh, this amazing concoction um, was presented to General McChrystal as an analysis of the field in which he was working. His dry comment on it was, when we understand that, we will have won the war. Which <laughs> <laughs> but it comes from the, the linear perspective. I mean, although it is a system, if you like, it's not really a system like any of the things that live, like human beings and their worlds, which is what we're really talking about. You can't possibly be helped by this series of arrows interconnecting things. What a great strategist does is to know a few important salient things intuitively out of a mass of other things and constantly to be revising them, changing and responding to them, but not doing an analysis like this. Now, um, next slide. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the right and left brain because, well, I got to. Um, and <laughs> I want you to put out of your mind everything that you think you know about the differences between the right and left hemispheres because it'll be entirely wrong um, unless you read my book. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and so I use this very helpful slide which comes from the internet and uh, I've entitled it Right and Wrong because it's um, a load of bollocks. And <laughs> the, the, there is actually one thing on the slide that is correct, but only one, and there's a free pizza for anyone who spots it. Next slide, <laughs> before somebody claims the pizza. Now, <laughs> this is what your brain looks like. 
Uh, for those of you not familiar with looking at brains every day, it's a bit like a walnut. It's got a great big divide down the middle. It's sort of wrinkly on both sides. And there's a band of tissue at the bottom called the corpus callosum, which is that uh, in the middle there, the brain has been drawn aside uh, to reveal uh, the corpus callosum. The guy's not looking too happy about this process. Uh, <laughs> Um, but then he died a long time ago. Um, but it, what I want to point out is that this is actually a rather small connection. And when I was in medical school, nobody said to me, uh, I wonder why the brain is divided. The question was simply passed over. In fact, I've never heard anyone ask it until I asked it. Um, because it's a rather odd thing to do. If you want um, uh, computing power, which I'm afraid is the model uh, that's often banded about by neuroscientists, I mean, I reject it, but nonetheless, it'll work for the moment. If you want to do uh, things that require and get their power from making connections, and that is what the brain... It's a mass of connections. That's really all it is. And if you want maximal power out of it, why put a whopping great divide down the middle? And only 2% of neurons actually communicate directly across the corpus callosum. So that's rather odd. And over time, we could have got rid of it, but we haven't. In fact, the division has got more pronounced with evolution, not less pronounced. Um, next slide. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that each hemisphere... It doesn't do a thing uh, like reason or maths or writing or, you know, as people used to say, or emotion, you know. Um, uh, the left hemisphere, by the way, is not reliable, boring, but at least, you know, unemotional. And it's entirely irrational. Uh, it's highly dangerous, and it's also very emotional. It gets very angry very quickly. Now, the reason you're not aware that these two neuronal masses are generating two experiential worlds with different qualities is uh, that it's all going on at a level below consciousness. In fact, if it was going on during consciousness, you wouldn't survive very long. So there is a centre here in the midbrain, that's the top of the, the brain stem, which is uh, uh, at the millisecond to millisecond level controlling where information is going. And I, I should stress that... Um, all the brain is working all the time. And it's not, nothing in nature is a hard and fast division. So what I'm going to say um, is set out uh, at some length in the book. It took me 20 years to write. And uh, I'm, what I'm going to say to you today is quick and dirty. So if it sounds a bit simplistic, um, cut me some slack. Right, next slide. And this is really just to show you how massively each hemisphere is interconnected. There are these long... Uh, tracts, which are rather like super highways, which are um, myelinated tracts. Myelin is a white substance that uh, is, is a sheath on nerves if you want them to uh, conduct particularly rapidly. So these are highly efficient tracts that knit each hemisphere together. So if you think, you can't talk about a hemisphere on its own. Well, no, you can't. But in fact, they are very, very highly interconnected, each hemisphere within itself. And they make quite coherent existential worlds. Uh, each of them uh, is enough on its own to maintain consciousness. You could have one of your hemispheres removed and you would still be a conscious being. However, the world would have changed radically depending on which hemisphere disappeared. Next slide, please. And that's really, uh, I'll gloss over it rather quickly rather than go into it any depth, but basically what it's showing you is that the brain is fundamentally asymmetrical. Um, it's broader at the front on the right. I'm afraid because of a tedious anatomical convention, the right is on the left and the left is on the right. So this is the right hemisphere over here. And it's broader and bigger at the front on the right. And it's broader and bigger on the left towards the back. And we heard all about this in medical school because it was said to be the language center. And that was the clever thing that the left hemisphere did. In fact, that can't be right because orangutans, bonobos, chimpanzees also have it and they have no language. Uh, also, we now know that the right hemisphere contributes to language anyway, and so the idea that you had to just get it crammed all under one roof isn't correct. And we know from endocasts of skulls of pre-linguistic man that also there was this enlargement. But also wasn't, what was not referred to in medical school was that the single most asymmetrical part of the brain is in fact the right frontal cortex. And that wasn't referred to because in those days the right hemisphere didn't do anything. Now, can we have the, the next slide? What I would say about that, incidentally, is that every single thing you can measure in the brain 
is asymmetrical. It's different between the two hemispheres. So they're different sizes, weights, lengths. They have different patterning, sulcal gyral markings on the surface. They have different white to gray matter ratios. They respond differentially to, to neurotransmitters and to endocrine, neuroendocrine hormones. So they're not, in measurable terms, which scientists like, at all similar to one, well, at all. Of course, they're very largely similar, but they do have quite distinct um, measurements, and that's just a puzzle, because, of course, all neuroscientists gave up thinking there was any difference between the right and left hemisphere a long time ago, because it figured in management seminars where people told you to release your right brain, and, and that is tacky, and um, so uh, they kept clear of it. But what happened was, can you move on? That, sorry, that's the book. That's just a subliminally say. If you go, <laughs> if you, if you go to um, Amazon or whatever, you invest the best £10 uh, of your life. No, next slide. No, sorry, next slide. That's that, that one, yeah. So uh, when I came to look at this, I was fascinated by um, a whole lot of things, which sadly I haven't got time to go into right now. But I did wonder a lot about what the differences were partly because a colleague of mine had written a completely amazing book, um, which came out in 1990 with OUP, my colleague John Cutting, and it was called The Right Cerebral Hemisphere and Psychiatric Disorders. Well, that was fascinating in itself, because, as I say, when I was in medical school, the right hemisphere didn't do anything. Um, and I went to a lecture he was giving and learnt that it did all kinds of fascinating things, which I'll be talking to you about shortly. However, while the human neuroscientists were going tacky, tacky, the, um, uh, and just knew that there couldn't be any difference, um, the behavioural scientists looking at animals and birds did what I always thought scientists were supposed to do, which was to observe, and uh, uh, they saw that birds and animals seem to use their hemispheres um, for different purposes. Now, how would you know that? Uh, well, um, in most animals and birds where the eyes are placed on the sides of the head, it's pretty much true that the left eye feeds to the right hemisphere and the right eye feeds to the left hemisphere. Because as you know, in the brain, everything's sort of crossed over like that, almost everything, except olfaction. Anyway, um, so uh, it's not true of us, by the way. Um, it's because we've got eyes on the front of our heads. That's because uh, when we're swinging from branch to branch, it's rather useful to be able to judge distances very, uh, very clearly, and for that you need eyes on the front of your head. It's also not true of predators like cats. But for, uh, for us, it's the left visual field of each eye, left eye and right eye, that goes to the right hemisphere and vice versa. Anyway. So um, this uh, handsome chap is the common wall lizard, and the reason I've put up a picture is that even at this level, you see some fascinating things. For example, if you put an eye patch over the uh, uh, left eye of this creature um, and present it with a predator, it will, instead of turning around and looking at, the, looking at it with the, the right eye, it will continue to try to use the left eye, i.e. right hemisphere, um, even though it's patched. Um, and what was this about? Well, this is my hypothesis, and I don't know a better one. <laughs> to be fair, nobody else has suggested a better one, I think. Uh, uh, there we are. Um, <laughs> if you are a bird or an animal, you have to solve a problem of survival, um, which is how to eat and stay alive at the same time, which is not a problem in central London in 2017. But it is a problem if you are a bird, for example, trying to pick out a seed against a background of grit uh, on which it's lying ahead of your competitors. You need to have an extremely sharply focused, narrow beam attention to that detail. But if you're only paying that kind of attention, um, you will end up... Uh, being somebody else's lunch while you're getting yours because you need to have a completely different kind of attention at exactly the same time, which is a broad, open, sustained, vigilant attention for all that may be around you in the, quote, environment. So, um, and this turns out to be what animals, all the animals, birds, fish, everything that we have um, observed has a tendency, it's not an absolute thing, but it has a, a remarkably significant tendency to use its 
the left hemisphere, and therefore right eye in these creatures, to look at tiny details and grasp them in order that they may be used. So to pick up a twig, to build a nest, to get your prey to catch your seed or whatever it is. But at the same time, they're using their right hemisphere, left eye, to look out for everything. Um, for predators, yes, but also for mates, friends, conspecifics. Um, and it's with the right hemisphere that those judgments about relationships occur. And if you want a quick and dirty sound bite, um, I would say that broadly speaking, the left hemisphere enables us to use the world, which is seen as a lot of fragments of things that we can exploit. And the right hemisphere sees the whole picture in which things seem very different. And I'll unpack that a little bit now. Next slide. Thank you. So um, this uh, mountain, which is uh, behind the house where I live on the Isle of Skye, and you can see why I live on the Isle of Skye, um, is uh, called, um, after a Norse expression, meaning the sloping rock, it's called Talisker. And those of you who know your whiskey will immediately, your spirits will, so to speak, rise at that, um, <laughs> that, that name. Um, and what that tells us is that this mountain, to the Norse people who first came to this part of the world a thousand years ago, was a landmark which signified a dangerous piece of coast, famous for its shipwrecks. So that's what that mountain was to the Norsemen, and that's why it was called the Sloping Rock. To the Picts, who we know lived in its shadow, because we've got remnants of the brochs that they lived in there, it was at the same time shelter from storms, and it was the home of the gods. To 18th century travellers who came first, it was something beautiful to draw and paint. To a geologist, it's a particularly fine example of a columnar basalt formation. Um, to an exploiter, it would be, uh, to, a, to, a, to a, what shall I say, entrepreneur, it would be a source of potential wealth uh, in, in which one hopes uh, he or she would be frustrated. And um, to a physicist, it's 99.99% space, and the other little bit is something that's only probabilistic and we don't know what it is. So, now, it, what I want you to take on board is that each of those is a perfectly correct description of the mountain. They're all true in their own way, because what a thing is, is what it is for me. It's not something out there that just exists and we've got to find out what it is. Everything, we have affordances, we have ways of using it, thinking about it, looking at it, relating to it. And that's not to say we can't be, make an effort to see it from other people's points of view. In fact, the more points of view you can see it from, the better. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, uh, if it's true that uh, what you attend to changes what it is that you find there, and I believe that profoundly to be true, something follows from this. If you think of the world as a machine, you will start to see machine-like elements in it, because that's the way you're approaching it. And so you will think, oh, the machine's a very good model. And then you use only the machine, and then you only see the parts of the world that are like a machine, not the parts that are not. But if you saw the world as a living, flowing, dynamic, perhaps conscious entity with which we are intimately related, you would find all sorts of evidence of that in the world. What that means is that where you jump into this hermeneutic circle, um, I like this picture of Escher's of hands because it shows that there is no proper place of starting this. You have to jump in with an intuition about what sort of a thing you're dealing with. But where you jump in will govern what it is you find. Can I have the next slide, please? So we harden up a picture of the world over time. We make a first guess, we find things that respond to it, that hardens it up, and so we get stuck in a particular mindset. And my thesis is that in the West, we have got very much stuck in the mindset of the left hemisphere. Now, the left hemisphere, remember, has a kind of uh, narrow beam attention to something that it wants to grasp. And in fact, it's the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which we grasp things. And it's also the left hemisphere that controls the bits of language, not all of language, that enable us to pin things down, as we say. I've grasped it. Now, the next slide, please shows that this way of thinking suggests that there are separate entities which cause one another, that A leads to B, and so on. 
a conventional Newtonian way of thinking. But if you think the attention of the right hemisphere can reveal something, could we have the next slide, please? It's not so much that A leads to B, but that um, there's something very, very complex and living and very large here that you can't simply pick apart and hope to understand the whole thing that you're looking at. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, <laughs> uh, this is really um, to say what happens when the left hemisphere takes over the world, and the answer is pandemonium, largely. Um, <coughs> and this is because, uh, and I don't have time today, alas, to go through all this, but if you take perhaps the 10 or 12 commonest delusional syndromes, and I mean truly delusional, the things that psychiatrists would call delusions, not just what Dawkins would call a delusion, uh, then almost all of them, if not all of them, are more common, significantly more common, like three or four times, and in some cases um, uh, they only occur after the left hemisphere is the one in control. There's been damage to the right hemisphere. So delusional states are very much associated with the left hemisphere. And interestingly, recently there's been some evidence that the left hemisphere is generally very much less reliable, it makes hasty judgments, it jumps to conclusions, it gets things wrong, and it doesn't have the breadth or the patience, the deep understanding of the world that we need. Can I have the next slide, please? So what actually happens in one way could be summarised as a loss of depth. Now that's quite interesting. I mean depth in as many ways as you can think of depth as having a meaning. Depth in visual space. So the sense of a depth of a world out there that you can go into is flattened, as it were, to a screen that represents the world. So for somebody who has damage to the right hemisphere, the world gets flattened in space. It also gets flattened in time. Time has depth. It has extension. It has flow. It's not a series of points. But when you have damage to the right hemisphere, it starts to be a series of points or planes that are not part of a continuous flow anymore. They're bits and pieces. Um, and you lose emotional depth. So all the things that come from rapport, from feeling for others, uh, from empathy, from understanding, from irony, from humour, from all those things get lost. And in their place, there's a kind of superficial jocularity which quickly turns to anger. So emotion, uh, emotional depth, visual depth, depth in time, all these things get lost. Next slide, please. How am I doing? I'm sorry. Oh, Christ, OK. Uh, <laughs> right, so this is just really to illustrate that um, when you have damage to the uh, uh, right hemisphere, you stop seeing spatial depth. So this is before an operation called callosotomy in which the brain is divided. And you can see that each hand can do a pretty good cube in perspective. After the operation, only the left hand is able to do so because now only it is getting information from the right hemisphere, which is normally passed across the corpus callosum. And the left hand that's been doing cubes all its life does what a child does, which is to flatten it out. Next slide, please. So I want to just run through some of the things that are differences. The left hemisphere prefers what is certain. After all, it's going to grasp things. So it prefers the familiar and the known, whereas the right hemisphere prefers what is new. Or uh, prefer is the wrong word, but it's able to understand the existence of something new. In fact, it's, it's much better at grasping that there's something different here. Ramachandran calls it the devil's advocate. It's the one that says it's not what you think it is. Next slide. Um, the left hemisphere, I've put more helpfully than the anatomical convention, the left on the left and the right on the right. So the, here, the, in each of these, and, and, and yes, uh, the one on the left is the left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere likes to narrow things down to a certainty. The right hemisphere wants to open up to a possibility. Next slide, please. Uh, so, for example, the right hemisphere is able to see that this could be a duck, it could be a rabbit. It's quite happy to sit with the ambivalence there. But the left hemisphere is going, what are you talking about? It's got to be a duck or a rabbit. You're annoying me here. Next slide, please. Um, the left hemisphere prefers fixity. Things are isolated, static, and therefore much more easily grasped and got. It's very sharp 
narrowly focused attention isolates things and makes them static, whereas the right hemisphere sees that nothing is actually separable from anything else in the universe. Everything is connected to everything. As John Muir said, if you try to extract any one thing uh, on its own, you pull the whole universe with you. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a, thing, a syndrome which happens after right hemisphere damage in which the normal flow of movement is turned into something like an old juddering cine film or like a stop-go animation. Next one. The left hemisphere is focused on parts, the right on the whole. Um, to the extent that the whole body image is in the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere understands a leg, an arm, or whatever, but it doesn't understand how they relate. Next one. Uh, this is really just to illustrate that, uh, that the idea of seeing things as a whole, you don't actually, although when you reflect on it, your left hemisphere tells you you build the world up from bits, but actually you don't. You don't go into your living room and go, hmm, a sofa, uh, a, a lamp, uh, oh, my living room. No, you see the whole thing, and then you focus on something that attracts your attention. And um, how many people have seen this before? Yeah, yeah. So it's a Dalmatian dog. Here is the nose, there's the ear, the back of the dog, the legs, and it, it, sniffing at the ground in the shade of a tree. And that is called gestalt perception. It means seeing the thing as a whole. You can't build it up from saying, oh, well, that's a piece of shade, that's a bit of dog. You can't do it that way. Um, next slide. Uh, this is really just to show the hierarchy of attention. Most people see an H before they see the E's. They see a 4 before they see the H's. Next slide. Uh, these are people with right hemisphere damage. That's a person, that's a bicycle in which you can see the R pedals, the R wheels, but the relative sizes are wrong and the position is wrong. It wouldn't get very far. And that's a, that's a house on the right there because it's got one of those things on top. Next, please. Mm -hmm. And that's from an animation you've probably seen on the internet. If you haven't, if you Google me on YouTube, you'll find a rather nice little animation. I, I haven't got time to go into that. Next one. Um, explicit versus uh, implicit. The le left hemisphere likes things to be explicit. The right hemisphere understands that a lot of meaning has to remain implicit. If you explain a joke, it's no longer a joke. If you translate a poem into prose, it's no longer a poem. All the really valuable things that we have in life, the things of art, the things of religion, the things of our love, these things can't be made explicit because they crash when they are, because in the implicit state they hold many, many things together that it just isn't possible to render adequately, explicitly in serial language. Next step, next one. Um, the left hemisphere prefers what's abstracted, whereas the right sees things in context, and that matters enormously. Context changes everything. Um, I saw this very much when I was doing literature at Oxford, which is why I, why I actually moved out of it, that when you start taking the words of a poem out of the context. You had something that was unique, embodied and implicit, and you end up with something abstract, generalised and explicit, which works in exactly the wrong direction for the work of art. Um, and uh, oh, let me just uh, say, in America, there are four sizes of cereal packet, OK? There's, um, there's jumbo, which means very large. And there's economy, which means large. And there's family, that means medium. And finally, there's large, which means small. And the reason I'm saying that is that context changes the meaning of a word. OK, next, please. Uh, the left hemisphere is interested in what is general, whereas the right hemisphere is interested in the unique case. A very sad, in a sense, a woman who had spent her life cataloguing the birds of Switzerland had a right hemisphere stroke and afterwards said, all the birds look the same. Next slide, please. Uh, Yes, the left hemisphere is more interested in the quantities of things, the right and qualities. Next. Uh, the left hemisphere, there's about six studies that demonstrate that the right hemisphere is more interested in animate things, the left in inanimate things, and the, in fact, tools and machines are coded only in the left hemisphere, even in left-handers who are using um, their left hand and therefore their right hemisphere to operate tools and machines. Next, please. Uh, and uh, the left hemisphere is optimistic, whereas the right hemisphere is not exactly pessimistic. It is a little bit, but it's more realistic. But this, is, this optimism is completely unreal. You can have somebody with a right hemisphere stroke. You can go and see them in hospital. Um, and this can be seen by any medic I I on a hospital ward. And they have a, if they've had a stroke with the right hemisphere, they can't move the left arm. And you say, how are you feeling? They say, fine, thank you. They say, well, that's very good. 
Um, no problem with your left arm then? No, none at all. Well, could you move it for me, please? And then they go, there, you see, I did. And you said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't see that, did you? No, no, none of us saw it. Could you do that again? And, and they still can't move it. But if you bring it round in front of them and say, move that, they say, oh, that, that belongs to the bloke in the next bed. Because when you've got only your left hemisphere going, everything is fine. Next. And the most important is that the left hemisphere world is represented as things are represented on a screen, on a computer, in our minds, abstract, two-dimensional, out of time and space, whereas they are present with all their vividness in the right hemisphere. Next, please. These are just to make that a little bit more um, uh, obvious. Here's a tree uh, drawn by somebody in the intact state. That's with their right hemisphere switched off, so the left hemisphere only, and that's the right hemisphere only, and you see that it's still got the living form of a tree. Next, please. Uh, same thing with flowers. They become geometric symbols in the left hemisphere as they've got the living form on the right. Next, please. Uh, this is really just to show that depth in space is better appreciated by the right hemisphere. Next, please. Um, this is just all by the left hemisphere. I just draw your attention to what happens to a person uh, in the left hemisphere. Next slide, please. This is, um, this is really, uh, cut a long story short, this is aggregated data from 126 people about the effect on their... Um, uh, intelligence after strokes and remember on the left is the right hemisphere on the right is the left hemisphere and they map the areas that were important for intelligence if you look at that going right through the brain you will see that the really key elements for intelligence are all in the right hemisphere not in the left and that's that's borne out by you know many studies next please okay so and I'm on my wound up okay yeah so um, Oh, crikey. Uh, <laughs> so, right. Let's do a thought experiment. Suppose I'm right that we are living in a world where we're thinking only in terms of the left hemisphere, not the right. We're attending to it in that narrow, fragmenting way, which deanimates and makes things available for grasp, but empties them of meaning. What would the world look like? OK, next. You have to keep clicking a bit. Um, there'll be loss of the broader picture. Next. Knowledge would be replaced by information, tokens or representations, ticks on a sheet of paper rather than the actual knowledge, and wisdom would be right out because that's embodied and personal. There'll be the loss of the concepts of skill and judgment, which again are the embodied products of experience, and they would be replaced by an algorithm that a computer could follow. Um, things would become simultaneously rather cerebral and abstract, and matter would just become lump and matter. That's what reification means, that things become thingy, um, whereas at the same time we lose touch with um, the tactile embodied reality of the world in which we all used to live until quite recently. Next one. Bureaucracy would have a field day because it has all these qualities. Just click, click. <laughs> um, these are all the things that are best done by the left hemisphere and they're what, according to Peter Berger, famous sociologist, bureaucracy prefers. There'd be a loss of the sense of uniqueness. Um, carry on. Uh, which would be replaced by um, assessments of quantity being the only criterion, not quality. There'd be a kind of black and white, either it's this or it's that, which one always encounters when dealing with an algorithm. Next... Uh, reasonableness would be replaced by rationality. I'm making a distinction between what the Germans call Verstand and Vernunft. Verstand being kind of um, a literal rationalism which uh, a computer could follow, and Vernunft being a reasonableness which comes from living in the world. Next. There'd be a failure of that very uncommon thing these days, common sense. Next. Systems would be designed to maximise utility rather than anything else. There'd be a loss of social cohesion, depersonalisation, Paranoia and lack of trust, schizophrenia, left hemisphere overdrive condition in which people become paranoid because they feel that things are out of control because their conscious mind is not controlling them. So we'd live in a world where we were under maximum observation, CCTV cameras, people would even be talking about DNA databases, that kind of thing. There'd be a need for total control by governments. Next, please. Anger and aggression would become the keynotes of our relationships because those are the ones that the left hemisphere is good at, we would project ourselves as irresponsible, passive victims of other people's wrongdoing. Not me, Gov, that belongs to the bloke in the next bed. Next slide. And this is the last slide. Art would become conceptual rather than embodied. 
and it would lack a sense of depth, there'd be distorted or bizarre perspectives because the right hemisphere is required for those. Music would reduce a little more than rhythm, which is the only aspect of music that the left hemisphere <coughs> in any way contributes to in most non-professional musicians. Um, melody and rhythm are very much right hemisphere based. Language would become diffuse, excessive, lacking in concrete reference, like those um, lever arch files of procedures and so on that management um, uh, insists one reads. Deliberate undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder, which is what the right hemisphere sees because it knows how little it knows, whereas the left hemisphere thinks it knows everything and finds the idea of awe and wonder um, irritating. Next. Flow would become just the sum of an infinite series of pieces. There'd be a discarding of tacit forms of knowing. We'd be ensnared in a network of small, complicated rules. The phrase is from de Tocqueville in America in 1830. You could see it coming. And we'd be spectators rather than actors, as Descartes proudly described himself in the world, sitting on the sofa with our six-pack instead of actually being involved. And all this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism. <laughs> Well, thank God we don't live in that world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sorry, that was it. Um, well, thank you, Ian. I, to use a right brain metaphor, um, I feel like I've been given loads and loads of seeds and they've been scattered all over my mind. <laughs> and hopefully, s some will rise up in the fertile imagination of my mind. Um, uh, and um, we have time for one question. Now, this has to be <laughs> the very best question <laughs> you've ever asked. I just wonder what it was, that when the tipping point was for you, when you were thought you were ready, because there's a huge amount yeah. of depth and breadth of information. In well, it took... It, it, it seriously took 20 years. And when I finished it, I had basically three books. One was on neurology, one was on philosophy, and one was on cultural history. And I said to my publishers who were at Yale, perhaps we could publish them as separate books. And my editor very sensibly said no, because what will happen is the scientists will read one book, the philosophers will read another book, and the arts people will read the other book. And what you won't get is the, ex the, the synthesis that you're looking for. And I think that was the very best piece of advice. Um, so that's how it happened. It took a long time. Um, it was painful. Um, at one point, I couldn't write it. I just thought I'm going to die before I've written it. I went into therapy to find out why I couldn't write it. <laughs> we never found the answer, but in the end, I wrote it. So maybe that was the answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>